today we're going to speak about intuitive eating. Now, when I think about intuition, I think more about me and my paintings, but not as much in eating. We're going to be speaking with Hannah Gantz, who she herself kind of went through like yo-yoing journey of diets where nothing really worked for her and she just found this new way of intuitive eating. So let's welcome Hannah Gantz. So hello, Hannah. Hi. <laughs> so welcome to my show. Thank you. I'd like to hear more. What is an intuitive eater? Whoa, big question. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually think everyone was born um, an intuitive eater. Uh, if you ever look at toddlers eat, they're kind of just like, they'll take a bite of this, a bite of that. Um, they know their last bite threshold, so they know you know, when they're done, you cannot get another spoon of applesauce into that kid's mouth when they're, when they're done. And um, essentially, it's someone who listens to their intuitive body cues for when they're hungry, when they're full, what they're in the mood for. And they are not um, plagued with or influenced by like the external ideas about food. So people telling them what to eat, how to eat, when to eat. It's um, a way of eating that's like really intuitive. It's less over here. So I'm pointing to my head. <laughs> it's less in the head and it's more in the gut, the body, which is where yeah. digestion takes place. So it kind of makes sense for it to be a body wisdom and not a, a brain wisdom. Yeah. So it's more like intuition. Yeah. But like whenever, if I like really follow my intuition, I'm just going to be eating like ice cream and cookies all day. <laughs> like, so, so that's like the number one question. A lot of people ask that. They assume that if they don't listen to these external rules about how to eat and how much to eat, that they're just going to eat like a crazy amount of this heav heavily sugary, carby food. And for a lot of people who first join intuitive eating because they've experienced so much restriction and they and were told they are told that you do not have to restrict it with intuitive eating. Restriction is not healthy. Um, they will test those limits and they'll eat as much ice cream as they want. Yeah. And when they understand that um, that it really is okay for, for them to have ice cream, <laughs> like yeah. it really is um, not bad or wrong or doesn't say anything about you as a person or you're not going to die, you know? Right. Um, they can start listening to their natural body cues. I don't believe a body wants to eat three pints of ice cream in one sitting. Right. It, the body has cues that makes it feel like, stop, like I'm a little sick, you know? Yeah. There are very loud cues when you really, really go too far. So mm -hmm. it's like physical nausea, you know, up to the point where you're vomiting. But there's actually more subtle cues that kind of give you like, actually I'm done right here before I get sick. Right. And when you're listening to the body, you can hear it and um, it's not, you know, it, it actually feels best to stop at that point. Intuitive eating is based on what makes the body feel best. So when you go past what your body's asking for, the body starts to feel a little bit physically sick. And when you're using those cues to determine when to stop, you're not going to end up eating cookies and ice cream until forever. It's just, right. it's just not what's going to happen. Yeah. A few things came up while you were speaking. The first thing is it kind of reminds me of like, um, in Judaism, like when you raise your kids with a lot of rigid rigidity mm -hmm. in the household of like, you can't wear this, you can't wear that. Like I remember for me when I was in high school and the principal lectured how we can't wear the choker necklaces. Cause mm. back in the day it was the trend of the non-Jews. And, and so that's why we can't wear it and we need to wear three quarter sleeves. And that's what made me want to rebel big time. And then mm -hmm. I had my old, my old journey where I wasn't really like as religious. Right. I kind of feel like it's very related to the food. Like when you know that eating something sweet or something delicious, instead of turning it into like, oh, I'm going to shove it into my mouth because I feel guilty about it. And to like, no, you're allowed to like wear the choker necklaces. You're allowed to wear short sleeves, like, you know, in moderation, enjoy it, feel feminine and like, you know, eat, eat those cookies, have that sit down, yeah, Hanukkah. <laughs> <laughs> like it, you don't feel as much of a need to like, let it spiral, spiral you into this vicious cycle. Right. Totally. I mean, restriction has like crazy psychological backlash. Like yeah. 
when someone's told they can't, suddenly they want to. It's right. like, don't think about, you right. know, elephants. And right. like now it's like, whoa, 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 I have to think about. Yeah, Simon you know, Sinek. Or like, you're going to move to a, a warm area and never experience cold again. Even if you like the warm right. you don't like cold. Suddenly you're like, wait, I'll never go skiing again. I'll, I'll yeah. never have snow again. You know, so being, when, you, when someone goes on a diet, and this is a big reason why we're anti-diet, um, they're basically telling their bodies, you can never have this kind of food again automatically the body's like whoa i need that i need that yeah and then it becomes a matter of willpower and and this food gets put in the like bad or wrong category and you end up hitting this like moral relationship with food where like i am good if i eat these foods i am bad if i eat other foods and it puts food on a pedestal like that it's like uh it creates this relationship with food where it's not even about how the food tastes how it makes you feel it becomes like a whole hierarchy. Yeah. An official hierarchy. Yeah. And, uh, and then people develop like severe disordered eating. Yeah. And, um, and diets don't work. 95% of diets fail. Really? Yeah. That's very, so very high percentage. So, so what the tip is to just like let go of the scale and just try to like incorporate healthy living until you see totally. the difference. Yeah. It, it's like how great, like, doesn't that sound so great? It sounds so good, but we're not capable. <laughs> well, it's not true. It's not true. We're totally capable. This really? came out in the eighties and yeah. it's been, it's here. I have the book right here. Like this has okay. been, uh, uh, it's called intuitive eating. Um, um, it's written by Evelyn Triboli and Elise Resch. Mm-hmm. They created this framework. Um, they are two dietitians mm. who, at first, when they started working, they were putting all their clients on diets, and they saw that it wasn't working. Not, nothing they did was working, and they started realizing that um, when you're trying to heal people's um, food issues, you have to work at their relationship level. It's like, I think of a relationship with another person. Like Everyone has their flaws and weaknesses, and, and you're seeing someone else, and you're like, okay, we're not getting along well, so I have to either like cut you out or, you know, change you. So interesting. As opposed to like, let's work on the relationship between us. Like what's happening between us? Yeah. How do I regard you? Yeah. You know, how do I relate to you? And then you can actually work on something that's sustainable. This is the most sustainable way of relating to food. Diets don't last. Intuitive eating, revolutionary anti-diet approach. Yeah, it's actually like a smicha program. Like they, they're the oh, ones really? who gave me my intuitive eating counseling. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. So you're smicha by uh, <laughs> Elise Resch and... Evelyn Triboli. Yeah. Lovely. So it's, it's really interesting. It almost sounds like, like family. You know, sometimes you're born into family and like you have a family member like you're not getting rid of. Like ice cream is not leaving the world. <laughs> right, 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 right. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And, yeah. People are... So people it's, are people food is not something you could get rid of you know people right. like call food an addictive substance or sugar an, addict, an yeah. addictive it's not something you can cut out of your life you have to face it every yeah. single day multiple times a day like right. this is where if, if you struggle in relationships this is where it'll show up like first and foremost because you're literally facing it all the time um yeah so if i'm not mistaken the way i see it is like not to get overly obsessed with with foods kind of keep yourself busy so simon sinek he is the one who in one of his speeches he speaks about your brain can't be programmed to think about the negative it's always about the positive like mm-hmm. if you say don't think of an, of an elephant you're going to think of an elephant mm-hmm. it's like if you tell a skater don't bump don't crash into the wall that's all she's going to think about mm-hmm. she, you're, so you need to keep on telling her like you know follow the line follow the line mm-hmm. follow the path and I think maybe in diets, it can like go into a way of like, just as a wife, as a mom, as a, as a person to just be like enthusiastic in your own house of celebrating fruit, celebrating vegetables. Mm. You go shopping, like get excited about going to smell the fruits in the store. Totally. Like looking like when you look at healthy, healthy recipes also, you it naturally gets you in the mood. It gets you excited. You know, like yesterday I was in the library in a frat and like, there's so many cookbooks about like salads and stuff. And I was like, wow, like if I had one of these cookbooks in the house, like all the time, like it gets you in the mindset. And also another thing I realized is I just started doing overnight oats. Mm. Um, I'm doing like a whole series on this nutrition. And like one, this one woman, um, 
Ruti Fuzan. She got me started on it. Have you ever heard of it? Mm. So it's really, really um, soothing breakfast. You basically take oats. Um, it's called overnight oats because you don't actually cook them. Right. Because when you're when you're cooking something, it actually reduces the nutritious level of it. So like you leave it out for three hours before you go to sleep. Um, like uncovered, it collects like microbiomes from the air. And you put it in the fridge overnight and you take it out in the morning and then it's left out for another three hours. And it's just like one cup of oats, a little bit of water, chia seeds, um, almond butter, a little bit of cinnamon. And it's like, and, and goji berries and raisins. And like, you have it. I just had it before I came and I was like, wow. Like it is so soothing. It's such mm. a soothing breakfast. Great. And like, and, and it was really interesting because she was actually talking about how oatmeal is like one of these foods with vitamin B, it's a complex carb, but it, it's actually designed to like calm your body down. Mm. And like, I think also, aside from being enthusiastic about the healthy foods, I think like when you really learn to eat slowly and, and eat these type of like nutritious foods, they for sure need to have like an impact on your mood and you're able you're able to see the impact they have on your mood. Yeah, I think there's a bunch of things I want to say as we were talking. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I guess I'll start with this. When it comes to nutrition, like you had said before, looking at the positive, like people think anti-diet is anti-nutrition, and it's absolutely not. Mm -hmm. um, nutrition totally plays a role in how we should uh, relate to food. For me, nutrition does take place in the mind, like the, like these the knowledge of like what is good for your digest digestive tract what is good for your you know a circulatory system mm -hmm. it's like and so so if people can get it, it gets tricky for people who have an unhealthy relationship with food first you have to clean up the relationship with food and only then once that's like clean then you can work with nutrition and the way i tell people to work with nutrition is only look at the positives it's like what does this food have to offer me right it's like these red vegetables like have have lycopene in them and lycopene does is good for you know inflammation or anti-cancer or like all these but not to look at like oh this you know uh, cookie will give me diabetes it's like that's not helpful for people um it's also not necessarily true and yeah so nutrition the way the way we look at nutrition and intuitive eating is like positive only approach like what does this food have to offer me because even if the food has nothing to offer you, you know, even if there's a, like a, we call it a low nutrient, we don't call it unhealthy, we call it like low nutrient density. It's okay. Like less that. nutrients. Yeah. But maybe it's doing, giving you some other um, benefit. Like maybe it's your birthday <laughs> and you want to, and you want a slice of cake and yeah. like, that's what it's giving yeah, you. It's, it has a soul. benefit. Yeah. And also all food has calories. Like calories are basic unit of energy. First like, of all, you need... cake has eggs in it, it's, you know, protein. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> totally. But like, even, even not taking it to the point of like proving that it is nutritious. It's just like not all foods have to offer you right. heavily yeah. nutrient benefits. Yeah. And if you look at it as like, what can this food offer me? You might end up just naturally veering towards the foods that are more nutrient dense. That's one thing. The second thing is, like you said, oats bring this like calming energy. Yeah. yeah. So I actually like I encourage people who practice intuitive eating to to feel it for themselves. Like, I don't want to tell you which foods bring what energies. Like, you have the capacity to feel it for yourself. How does a bowl of oatmeal make you feel? How does a bowl of hot oatmeal that you just cooked this morning versus a, a bowl of, of overnight oats make you make your body feel? Your body has that wisdom to tell you. Can I answer the question? I really want sure. to. Sure. Okay, so anytime <laughs> I actually cook oatmeal, I always feel like it's so heavy. Mm. It's so bulky. I always feel stuffed in a way of like, what did I just do to my body? And it always puts me to sleep. And it's just like, it's absolutely tasteless no, most of the time, unless I add ton, a packet with like honey or sugar. And it just doesn't really do much for me. Now, with overnight oats, okay, I'm like hooked. I feel like I'm like, I've seen the light. <laughs> You're like low key advertising. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Got to collab with some uh, oats company out there. Um, I feel like every time I have it, it's like my body takes in the oats right away mm -hmm. and like, I don't, I don't feel tired. I feel just calm and like vital to start my day. And it's like something that I'm like looking forward to every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, okay, I'm going to have my overnight oats now with all the little, like, you know, preparations I did with like the little flavors in the side and the chia seeds that like, you know, marbleized and stuff. <laughs> and also it has like this little... It, it has like milk because it's from the oh it's like oat milk basically right. you're leaving the water with the oats so it's like nice and creamy 
It's really, cool. really, it's just a lighter feeling. Right. Yeah. So yeah, so I would say that like when it comes to something like that, like for me, I, I like to cook my oats and I like to eat it in the morning and it doesn't make me feel heavy. It doesn't, it actually gives me like a good source of energy. I last many hours on oatmeal. It's one of the foods that gives me like long sustainability. Really? And, and you know, like because of, because of the fact that me and you are having different experiences is exactly the reason why I never tell people what to eat. Mm, interesting. Because no two bodies process foods the same way. Right. So telling someone you eat this, you're going to feel this is just not true. Right. You know, like people say, eat a lot more, a lot of protein and you'll have a lot more energy. Like that's not true for my body. My body needs carbs for energy. Right. Um, carbs is always the enemy. You know, so like I was walking around for years with no energy. <laughs> and so it's like encouraging people to listen to their own bodies instead of telling people what to right. eat so that their bodies will feel good to me is just right. makes a lot more organic sense. Like what's, like what's right and what's wrong. So something that I find very interesting, I have, I have like eight month old baby. Oh, nice. And he's like, he's incredible. I love him, I love him so much. <laughs> it's really bracha and like, Whenever I feed him, like we don't feed him sugar yet. Mm -hmm. And I find it so fascinating how these little babies, before you give them sugar, it's like they know exactly how much to eat. And they know when they're full. They don't overfeed themselves. Like he loves milk, you know, I'll give him a bottle of milk. But when he's full, he just won't open his mouth. Mm -hmm. And like, and I'm feeding him like all of these, all these different types of foods. And it's just so interesting to see how like, before you get your child started with actual sugar, I feel like they have so much more of a connection to that, that muscle inside of them of like knowing how much to eat. Wow. Um, I have a totally different way of relating to sugar. Really? <laughs> yeah. I don't think it's the enemy. I don't think it's the I don't think either, it distorts someone's mind But I think it's a either. drug. I, I really do think it's a drug of like, once you have it, you want more and more of it. And like, there is an exception with my son. There are these little like like these little purees that say on them like high level of sugar and whenever I give it to him the only reason it's high level sugar it's natural sugars but whenever I give it to him then he's like willing to eat non-stop but like with all of the other foods with avocado um with with what else does he eat with sweet potato like you know with chicken for example he'll eat and then he'll stop but it's only with the sugar that he's like Oh, I just, I'll finish this whole tub, you know, in, in a second. So I've done a lot of research on this. Yeah. Like a lot of research yeah, on sugar. Really? And sugar is like so hated. Yes. Um, the research shows that the only time, I mean, they did, they did a study with rats. The only time rats showed addictive behaviors around sugar were then, was, was when it was only given to them for certain hours of the day. So when they had intermittent access to sugar. When there were rats who had access to sugar 24 hours a day, they did not show addictive behavior to sugar. The reason why a lot of people show addictive behaviors towards sugar is because they don't let themselves have it. Really? Yeah. And then, and then I've also done a lot of, a lot of research on like um, sugar itself as compared to uh, high fructose corn syrup and fruit. And it's like when, it, when you break it down in your stomach, it breaks down into fructose and glucose. Also high fructose corn syrup, also an apple. It's like the same thing it breaks down to in really? your stomach. Yeah. The difference between an apple... And a piece of candy is that the apple has the added benefits, like I was saying before, with nutrition, added benefits. It has the added benefits of fiber, vitamins, minerals, nutrients. Right. You know, whereas uh, a piece of candy will only have will only have the sugar. Do I think sugar is bad for you? No. Do I think it's better to have foods for you that are going to also give you something else to give you longer sustaining capacity, to give you healthy bones, healthy skin? You know, like yeah, that's all great. So if we're comparing this to like. People, it's like a guy who's dating a girl just because she's pretty, <laughs> as opposed to dating like an Eshet Chayo, who's also fit, who's also a go-getter, career woman, and pretty. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Definitely. It lines Go up. for all the things. Go for all the things. Yeah. In your food. Yeah. It makes, it makes lots of sense. But there's plenty of, I, I'm not saying feed your baby, your eight-month-old sugar. That's not at all what I'm, what I'm trying to recommend. But I'm saying that. You'll see plenty of kids who have access to sugar and do not grow up with food issues. They mm. do not grow up right. obsessed with sugar. They do not grow up, you know, in unhealthy bodies. They do not grow up with unhealthy relationships with food. You know, right. I think of like my best friend in elementary school. She always had that huge pantry drawer in her kitchen. And from my kitchen, which was like very limited, I would always run to her house, open up and like be so excited. She wasn't. She had, you know, accessibility to it all the time. And yeah. she grew up to have a totally normal relationship with food, you know. It's just, um, 
eating sugar doesn't mean now you have a, an addictive substance in your body. That's so interesting because I find whenever I start on a loop of like white sugar, I just want more and more. So I used to think the same. Uh, if I had like chocolate in the house, I'd be like, no, 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 I can't have chocolate in the house. If I eat one bite, I'm going to eat the whole thing. You know, if I have one slice of cake, I'm going to eat the whole thing. And I did. I would have one slice of cake and eat the whole thing. And then when I worked through turning food into a body wisdom, mm-hmm. um, I have, I can forget that something's in my, I like there's ice cream in my freezer. Maybe. I honestly I don't know. I don't remember. So you, so you do buy it, but you buy it intentionally knowing that like you don't need to eat it. It's just going to be there. And if you want it, it's there for you. I don't need to eat any. I mean, I need to eat because I need to live. But like, there's yeah. no foods that I I have to eat before my day's over. Right. It's not like, oh, I didn't eat a vegetable today. It doesn't happen right. for me. I end up eating vegetables every day because right. my body wants it. Yeah. But there are no rules. No, so, there are no rules. Right. For me, I, I I very often feel like after I eat a meal, I have such like a sweet tooth. Like I need to have something sweet at the mm-hmm. end of the meal. Great. This other woman, no, so Ruti, this lady that I spoke with, she said that it's because you eat too fast like if you eat slower you don't have as much of a need i don't think there's something wrong with saying i want to have something sweet at the end of a savory meal have something sweet like there's not you don't have to look for the reason for what's wrong with me wanting something sweet and there's nothing wrong with it right have something sweet at the end of your meal what are you in the mood for what does your body want well i think there's also foods that like that are good for that. For example, she says that if you really are in the mood and you do have a sweet tooth, you should have like dark chocolate. Dark chocolate is really good. So I guess like what you said is like there are foods that are sweet that also give you nutritional value and then ones that just don't do much for you. Maybe that's what it's about. It's not. No? (laughs) I don't know. Like I'm really trying, I'm really trying to be there. Like I'm really trying to be like, you know, if you're having sugar, it's not like because you just had sugar now, you're not going to walk around the rest of the day like, oh, I just had half a bar of of like wow, yeah. of chocolate why not just have the ice cream i would just have the ice cream why not just wow yeah that's, yeah have that so that's that's the relationship with food where food has power over you yeah where like i can't eat a bite without then continuing to think about it afterwards so what is your day like how does my it, day is like i will eat okay first of all i don't think about food seriously and, <laughs> the you're, obsession's an, and gone. you're an intuitive food yeah coach. because it's intuitive it's not Interesting. it's not living uh-huh. up here I wake up, I have a coffee because I love coffee. Um, and then I wait until my hunger cues set in. So sometimes they'll set in very early, eight, nine in the morning. Sometimes they'll set in at 10 or 11. Whenever wow. they sit in is when I eat. And then in that moment, I'm asking myself, what do I want to eat? Right? So sometimes it's a savory breakfast, like eggs. Sometimes it's sweet, like peanut butter on toast with banana, you know, or sometimes it's like really sweet, like a croissant. Or sometimes it's, a pure protein, Ugh, I hate these words, like, like eggs, like, like hard boiled eggs, you know? Um, and then after breakfast, I don't think about it anymore. It's like that I enjoy it. I stop when I'm full. I feel like a sense of fullness, not a sense of stuffedness. Stuffedness doesn't feel good in the body, but I eat until I'm full and then I continue on my day. <laughs> and then same thing happens around lunchtime, which could happen also, okay, when it comes to timing, it's not even like, now it's 1.30, I have to eat lunch. It's like, when does my next hunger set in? It could be two hours later, it could be three, it could be four, it could be five. I don't mm-hmm. know how many hours later it's going to hit. Mm-hmm. When it hits is what I trust. It's like, that's the moment that my body's ready to eat again. My body is sending me a cue telling me it's ready to eat. And then I check in again, like, what's my body craving right now? And depending on the, my energy level that day, uh, my time of month, depending on the season, you know, depending on whether or not I'm in traveling mode and like yeah. there are so many different things that are going to factor into what I'm craving. Um, my body does crave nutritious food. It's just a natural thing for the body to crave. Right. So I will have, you know, nutritious meals at the end of the day. Um, so then I'll do that for lunch. Same thing for dinner. Wait till hunger sets in. Eat till fullness. Eat whatever I want. I'm not calculating at all how many grams, how many calories, what I ate earlier, what I should eat for dinner, what I'm allowed to eat. After dinner, I'll usually want something sweet also. I have sweet foods in my house to, to give myself something yeah. sweet when I'm looking for it. Right. Sometimes I open my fridge and there's nothing in there that I want. I don't force myself to eat something I don't want to eat. I go out and buy myself the thing I want to eat. You know, I have the liberty to do that. Again, not every meal is going to be this like 
perfect meal where I feel so satisfied and so happy with what I chose. Like sometimes I'm at work and I made myself a tuna sandwich for lunch and that's what I have. So it's not going to be this like 10 out of 10 satisfaction, but it'll still be, you know, I, I still have the concepts in my mind that I'm constantly working on giving my body exactly what it's asking for. So it sounds like you have a pretty balanced and first of all, congratulations, you're very, very in tune with your body. Yes, that's what intuitive eating is. That's it. So you just need to get in tune with your body. High, high, high awareness. Are you also in tune with your emotions? Yeah, because they're a body thing. Oh my gosh. Emotions are a physical sensation, right? You can feel sadness, anger, happiness. It's like, it's a very, very physical sensation. And some emotions, by the way, mimic hunger, right? So it's like, if I'm, or rather some physical sensations that are related to emotions. How are you doing? Right now, I'm feeling excited. (laughs) Really? What did you eat? (laughs) For breakfast? Yeah. I actually wasn't so hungry until you oh, showed really? up. I'm going to eat after you leave. Oh, my gosh. Okay. I it's get that. It's still morning. Um, Sometimes when you're really hungry, you get like, you know, I, I at least get like high and like in a really good mood sometimes when I haven't eaten in a long time. Okay. So, the, so this is another thing with intuitive eating. Well, I could talk about this all day. Okay. Is when you let yourself get too hungry, yeah. it's going to be very hard to eat intuitively mm. because your body's in like uh, a frenzy yeah. in starvation mode. It needs yeah. to eat now right and when you're in a you know let's say you put it on a one to ten scale which we do that's what we do in intuitive eating if you're waiting to eat till when you're at a one right till when you're starving you're gonna end up eating till a ten yeah which is when you're stuffed yeah both of those feel very not comfortable in the body right strong hunger doesn't feel good strong fullness doesn't feel good so we tell people to eat it around a three and eat until around a seven both of those feel excellent there's like this optimal Mm. sweet spot for how your body is going to feel um, <clears throat> I was, I, there was something else I wanted to say. Oh, I'll continue talking and it will come to you. Oh, the emotional thing. Okay. Uh, okay. See, it works. So there are certain, <laughs> there are certain, so how am I feeling right now? Yes. So like right now I'm getting, I feel myself feeling like riled up about talking about this topic because it's something very important to me and I get kind of fiery. So like I'm feeling energy in my cheeks. They're getting warm. I feel like a like high vibration in my in my arms down to my fingertips, um, and yeah, like this kind of um, expansive expansive sensation in my chest. Like that's the physical sensation of excitement for me hmm. right now. Hmm. Like I feel if I was going to translate this over into movement, like I could go for a run right now. Like I'm excited. It's incredible. I should come do a podcast every day with you. <laughs> I meditate every day, by the way. For really? The season. Yeah. Oh I my meditate. gosh. I meditate so that I can really go in a deep dive into my body's physical sensations because that's where the information is. That's incredible. Body information is in the body. It's just like wow. so wow. clear to me. Well, you know, the sages used to do that. They used to go and meditate an hour mm. before they daven, and then they would meditate an hour after they daven as well. Cool. So it's like a true connection. But like for me, what boggles me is that we walk around in this world where everyone's like, so how are you doing? I'm like, oh my God, that question always catches me off guard. Like, I feel like I need to do a body scan. I'm like, hey, how's my head? How are my legs? How's my heart doing today? Like, I don't know. I always feel like it's such a loaded question. That, it's like, great that you take it as loaded. That means you really want to answer it honestly. I so really, many people are just like, ah, oh, I'm fine. I, I really want to. And right. in fact, I've been on a search for a really long time about like, how do you get in tune? And so I bought like this book by Renee Brown, Atlas of the Heart. Mm-hmm. I haven't read it. So she's, she's a really great speaker and she, she says how like, you know, the reason she wrote it is because like, instead of people just being like in four different moods, happy, sad, tired, or angry, there's a whole palette of colors Mm. to the moods that you have and to the sensations you're feeling. And Mm -hmm. maybe when you learn a little bit more about what each one of these sensations are, you can, you can really answer that mm-hmm. question. You can be more in tune with it. Mm-hmm. You can recognize it more. Mm-hmm. And then you can be more in tune when someone asks you, how are you doing? Beautiful. I yeah. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, I find that there are, you know, when, you, when you're when you really listening to your body, you can tell, um, you know, a lot of people emotionally eat. So they'll eat when they're feeling a strong emotion. Mm-hmm. Um, Janine Roth is one of my favorite authors mm-hmm. again i have her book here oh, yeah, it's a really if i'm going to recommend one book to everyone it's women food and god by janine roth oh, she's wow. wonderful anyway one of her books she says this line that says you can never have enough of what you don't of what you didn't really want right so someone wants someone's feeling sad or lonely and they're wanting physical affection 
a hug and they don't have that available so they go for a cookie so they'll eat a cookie and it's like mm, nope i'm not satisfied and they'll eat another cookie and it's still not satisfied eat another cookie so mm. why are they never getting satisfied because it's not what they actually wanted right what they actually wanted was a hug right so you can never have enough of the thing so that wasn't the thing that you actually wanted wow. because you keep thinking maybe the next bite will give me that right so when we work through intuitive eating we teach people to listen to biological hunger which is just the physical sensation of your body needing food but there are so many other hungers right hunger is like the basic sensation of need right it's like when you're a baby the first thing you cry out for is food um so that sensation of needing something of wanting something it's like kind of a pulling sensation of the chest i would say interesting it it's, it very much mimics hunger mm. so people will then go eat it's like oh my body's telling me i'm hungry is it is it yeah. biologically hungry or you're right. looking for something else and when you're aware that it's actually not biological hunger you have now the tools to go give yourself what it is that you're really needing right. so yeah it's, it's like the relationship between intuitive eating and learning how to listen to your emotions and give yourself what you're actually needing is like yeah. one of the huge benefits of this practice yeah well we're obviously sitting at a very strategic place because <sighs> we have all of these but it sounds like it's really about like implementing healthy habits for example when you're surrounded by food obviously you're always going to think that oh this salad looks great even if it's a salad so i just want to eat but like for example when you're finished eating when you put the food away and you carry on with your day you carry on cleaning running errands I feel like then your your body isn't as inclined to just go randomly and eat. Like then then you really are a little bit more focused on like, wait, what is it that I really need? Mm -hmm. You know? Oh, I'm I'm not fully understanding your concept. Are you saying with boredom when someone's bored? Like yesterday, for example, I was I was thinking about eating. I was just like, yeah, maybe I should eat. And then suddenly I had to go take care of my son and then I'm sitting with my son and I see all the laundry and I'm seeing like all the dishes I need to do. And then like, I just got caught up with doing that. And when I was doing that, I was like, wait, I'm really not that hungry. Like I'm getting more satisfaction from doing this right now mm -hmm. than from actually just randomly eating. Mm -hmm. I think when you implement healthy habits of, for example, when you're not eating, you put the food away, you know, like to yes to have like set hours where you are supposed to eat as opposed to just like randomly i kind of feel like it would be easier for you to just live a healthier lifestyle mm -hmm. and eat at just i don't know healthier i am times. hearing an underlying bias in you saying that eating is bad it's like not that oh it's, put not the food that, away no, no, so that no, you're not tempted no, not, by it. not that it's bad it's that when you're constantly surrounded by food anytime you're wanting something or needing something if you're if the food is right there it's almost like going to blind you from like, what do I really need? Right. I think that instead of clearing out the external atmosphere of like taking away food, putting it away, get, keeping yourself busy, but rather increasing the um, volume of your internal world, right? Of your body wisdom, of your body cues, of your, of your desires for what you want to eat. If that's loud, you can be in a candy shop. You can be in a in Trader Joe's, and if you know that you don't want it, you know, you're not going to have it. If you know that it's not... I guess you can compare it to someone who works in a candy shop. So it's like all day he's surrounded by cookies <laughs> or like candy, so he will be more tempted. Yeah. Um, so in that case, so how do you strengthen your body cues? Oh, so it's, uh, it's a lot of internal work. It's not... Um, you know, and people think intuitive eating is just like, stop dieting, eat whatever you want, whenever you want. And it's actually like a lot of work of going into your physical body, feeling it out. Um, so there, I mean, the intuitive eating um, framework is a 10 step framework. Like there is a, a oh, very yeah. clear way of working through this process because it is very hard. You know, it's a deep paradigm shift um, and it takes a bit, essentially breaks it down one by one where like, clearing out diet mentality, um, honoring your hunger cues, um, respecting your fullness cues, um, finding what satisfies you, um, finding which movement feels good in your body, um, body positivity, you know, body acceptance. Um, there, I mean, there's a bunch more, but what I personally do is uh, meditation for me is just a big part of it. It's like, it's not going to be, it, how, gaining this body knowledge is not going to come in the form of thoughts. So I can't 
explain it in words which are coming from my mm. thoughts. It's coming from my body. It's going to feel like something. Mm -hmm. So um, training your yourself to shut off your mind and start listening into presently what's happening inside your body, you know, it's, it's, it takes a while. It can take years. Is there like a few minute meditation that you can like guide us through? Sure. Yeah. Right now? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> okay. 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 So I'll get comfortable in a seated position. Make sure your back is supported. Close your eyes. Take a deep breath. In through your nose. And out through your mouth. And I just want you to start with feeling the physical sensation of the crown of your head. How do you know where your head ends and the air begins? Can you feel that with your eyes closed? If you can't, it's okay. There's no judgment. You're going to slowly move your attention down your face. So feel your forehead. Can you feel that you have a forehead? What does having a forehead feel like? Down to your eyelids. Linger for a second on your nose and feel the air rushing in and out of your nostrils. What does that feel like? How do you know you're taking an inhalation and how do you know you're exhaling? What's the difference in physical sensation? Now come down to your jaw, your mouth. Is it loose? Is it clenched? Are your teeth touching each other? Or is your tongue resting in your mouth? Come down to your neck. Is there any physical sensation there? Come to your shoulders. And slowly, you're going to bring your attention down your arms to your fingertips. Try to think of the areas you haven't paid attention to in a while. Like uh, the area under your arms, for example. The crook of your elbow. Can you feel each fingertip separately? Can you feel a pulsing sensation anywhere? And now I want you to come back to your chest. Feel a gentle rise and fall of the breath. Can you feel your heartbeat? Again, there's no judgment if you can't. Just notice whatever it is you're feeling. Temperature, tingling, pressure. Can you describe an emotion you're feeling right now in your chest? Like where is your emotional state right now? And how do you know that? What is the physical sensation of that emotional state? If your emotional state is calm or bored, what does that feel like? Boredom also feels like something. And now come down to your stomach. We're gonna do the same thing we've been doing, which is just feeling the physical sensations where does your clothing hit here? Can you feel the edge of your clothing? Can you feel a sensation of hunger or fullness? If you do, what does that feel like? Do you feel an emotion here? And for those who struggle with their body image, do you feel any resistance on bringing attention to this area of your body? Can you slowly whisper to yourself right now, I accept you, I trust you? Can you say thank you to your stomach for doing all this work of digestion for you for all the years of your life? Trust that it knows what it wants. Commit to listening to it. You're going to bring your attention now to your back. 
slowly bring down your attention to each vertebrae. Is there any pain, stiffness, or is there any comfort? Bring it all the way down to your bottom. Notice that you are supported by the chair underneath you. Can you release into that? You really are supported. In general, if any thoughts ever cross your mind while you're meditating, recognize it as a thought. Don't judge it and just gently bring your awareness back to your body. Now we're going to come down to our legs and we're going to do a similar scan, slowly scanning our way down our legs all the way down to our toes. When you finish, see if you can feel your whole body at once as one cloud of sensation. See if you can release the image of what your body looks like and only feel what your body feels, which feels more like a cloud rather than a very structured uh, you know, sensation. Come back to your breath. Take a moment of gratitude that this body was given to you to use, to respect, to love. It's only yours to know. And yeah, if you believe in a creator, you can thank your creator. And whenever you're ready, gently open your eyes. Yeah. Wow. Mm. You know, our body is really just like a vessel, a temporary vessel for nishamas. Yeah. Yeah. It's not our enemy. Yeah. We don't have to fight it. Yeah. Also, it's here for us. Yeah. And also, like, I guess to appreciate it, like, it's like what you said, our, our stomach has, our, our, what do you call it? Our stomach has just been Doing digesting, digesting food our entire life. <laughs> you know? We have to, like, be kind to it. Yeah. Yeah. Treat it with respect. Amazing. Well... This has been so pleasant. Mm -hmm. I'm so happy. And um, so I just wanted to ask one last question. So mm -hmm. what does a session with you look like? Mm -hmm. Like, do you bring out foods and then they talk uh, about their feelings of the foods? Or? Sometimes, yeah. Really? Thank you for asking. Um, <laughs> first of all, if you want to check me out, I'm on intuitively underscore eats on Instagram. And I'm also intuitivelyeats.com. Um, and yeah, I give one-on-one -on -one sessions. Um, it's usually lasts about three to four months, um, although it totally depends on the person's relationship with food. Um, we usually start with just going into like the person's long history with how they relate to food, starting with their parents and, and uh, how it's changed with them throughout the years. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then we'll walk through, work through the principles together. So, you know it's mostly conversational and then I give like homework throughout the week for what a person should be um, working through. Um, there are certain things that are best done when there's food in front of you. So like discovering satisfaction, like what I'm in the mood for, you know, it's like really helpful to have a full spread of, of food so out to see like, Oh, I just ate a date. What am I craving next? It's actually not something sweet. Now my body is wanting something savory. So yeah. So we'll do that sometimes with clients. Um, yeah, I've also like brought clients into the shook. Oh, I was just thinking of asking you that. That's sort of like it's a celebration of flavors. Yeah, and colors, and you yeah. can see you can see the nutrient colors when you walk through the shook, and smells, and uh, you know people are people have a very limited amount of foods they have in their homes, which is based on like habit or what they grew up with, and there's actually so much food available out there that's delicious and beautiful mm. and cool and interesting. Yeah. And the body is always going to want variety, so like 
getting that exposure and seeing what it feels like in your body to be exposed to variety, you know, mm. and see what your body is curious about. It's like totally a part of it. Yeah. That's so great. It's so exciting. And what's like one, one way, how do you consider a healthy, intuitive way of approaching this Hanukkah that's coming up with oh. the Sibania and all the oil that's packed everywhere? Okay. Well, guilt is not an ingredient. Okay. <laughs> that's it. It's just like... <laughs> Eat like a donut if you want it. A mantra. Guilt is not an ingredient. Mm-hmm. Respect your body. You know, mm-hmm. respect your hunger. Respect your fullness. Yeah. Know that it's available for you another time. Mm-hmm. Meaning, if you don't want it right now, okay. You don't have to have it because it's Hanukkah. Right. You know, the same food's available for you when you want it. Mm-hmm. And and if you want it, enjoy it. And sit with it. You know, turn yeah. off distractions. Sit down. Be with each bite and see if you can sense when your body says, "says I'm I'm done with that. It was great, and I'm done." Yeah. Wonderful. Awesome. Thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you.